Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Thanks for being here. This week, our project is an Arkansas toothpick. I'll talk more about that in a minute, but I'm using some 80 CRV2 steel for part of this blade here. And this is going to be what we're calling a power core blade, which means there's a center piece of pattern welded Damascus steel forge welded into the blade. So pretty cool. And uh, this 80 CRB2 here, it's, the stock is 3 8 by 1 inch, I believe. Closest thing I can get to a square bar, so I have to work it down a little bit here for our intended purpose. And the 80 CRB2 has become one of my main and, and favorite steels after working with quite a number of different steels. There's, there's a lot of different great steels out there. But this one in particular, it's a, it's a very tough high carbon steel with a pretty simple heat treat, relatively simple heat treat process to get the good the results that the steel um, is capable of. Yeah, just super tough, super tough. It's got about 0.8% carbon in it and then a little bit of chromium and a little bit of vanadium. So it's, it's great stuff. This uh, piece here I'm forging down is a bar of pattern welded or Damascus steel that I forged over a year ago. And it is a 400 layer twist pattern made from 1084 and 15 and 20. So this is gonna be the power core uh, piece in our blade here. And I actually kind of forgot what I was doing when I forged this down. Um, I, I wanted to uh, make the ratio of the steels in this blade such that the in the finished blade, the power core would be more prominent. And to do that, I, I should have forged the Damascus about one inch wide and a half inch thick and set it into a square bar of half inch like I did the outside pieces. Uh, this is only the second time I've done this power core technique. Uh, the first one, if you watched the video, was on a little Puko style blade where we used uh, uh, cable Damascus as the power core. So learned a lot from that and trying to apply some of that to this. And I'm sure the next, the third time I do this, it'll I'll, you know be able to apply even more. But anyway, still still going to turn out really cool. But uh, just kind of experimenting with you know the the ratio of steels you know for the for the desired finished product and stuff. It's just that's kind of the fun part, I guess, is learning learning all this stuff as you go. So prep those bars for the forge welder uh, about four and a quarter inches long here and uh, clean those surfaces off, stack them together, and uh, get ready to forge weld them, forge weld them together. So talk about the Arkansas, Arkansas toothpick a little bit. And the, the history behind it is, it's similar to, well, let's we'll start at the beginning. Uh, once upon a time, no. Really the, the name is, is something that at least at one time was really interchangeable with the Bowie knife and so far as we know both knives um, sort of came to be at the same point of in history in the same area and in the same you know for the same purposes which ultimately was self-defense that's what the uh, main right you know purpose for the Bowie knife was as a weapon um, and if you needed to defend yourself. So um, the original Bowie knife, so far as we know, was actually made in Washington, Arkansas. And so right away you can see that there's some, at the very least, parallels and probably plenty of crossover to these two blades. And there's, there's Bowie knives that have at least partial double-edged blades, you know, of, of dagger-like uh, proportions and design. It, it, you know, it's very, very varied. Um, the the name Bowie knife itself is not something that can be applied to any specific design of knife, and that's from the original era. You know, not just over time. Um, I think today the term Bowie knife really designates a more uh, specific design than it did back then. So all that to say, the Arkansas toothpick um, is simply a big knife that was intended for self-defense, but today it is recognized as a double-edged blade of a dagger-like um, design. 
typically with a rounded handle. And so that's, that's what I'm building here. So I've got these uh, three bars forge welded together. And now it's time to forge the tip together so that we have a uh, continuous uh, piece of mono steel around, around the point of the knife here. And you see I cut out that V and now I'm kind of dressing up the uh, sides of the V with the grinding wheel. So put a little bit of a radius on there, clean out that V to make sure that there's no you know, real gouges or grooves in there that would cause problems during the forge weld. This, you know, putting a radius on those sides of that V, I, I like how it helps the, the forge weld come together. Uh, if you put too much of a radius on there, you end up with kind of a line on the outside of where your forge weld is, simply because those radiuses don't come together completely. Not a huge deal. You're going to grind that off anyway, but something to keep in mind. So as always, it's really important to make sure you use plenty of flux on an open atmosphere forge weld like this. But really it is kind of the best case scenario because the way we're doing this is as we close that V up, it's um, very efficiently forcing out any impurities and, and flux, uh, molten scale, etc. as we, as we f squish it together. So it's, uh, it's really not that hard to accomplish this. But uh, you know, it takes several heats, at least it does for me, to get that completely closed up and keeping the steel clean in between. The first time I did this on that other little knife, I was using stock that was too thin, and it was probably, I don't know, 3 16 thick. It was a little easier to move or close up in this particular part of the process, but uh, overall this these half inch wide square bars uh, are working much better to do this technique than the thinner stock did. So essentially what I'm doing here is using the angle of my workpiece here in conjunction with the anvil and then the angle of my hammer to apply that force sort of at, at an angle so that we're you know, creating a, a point instead of hammering directly or straight down, that's not putting the force um, against the side of that forge weld like you want to. So that's sort of the technique I'm using here. Trying to get that closed up all the way down to the end here. The very tip didn't forge weld together, which is kind of par for the course. Um, you know, so thin right there at the end that may cool off real quickly coming out of the forge. So I imagine it had something to do with it, but it's not really a big deal. You just grind back a quarter inch there and have good, uh, a good solid forge weld. So just part of the process. Switching out the forging dies here for a uh, little narrower dies for better PSI and start squishing this thing down. So it's, it's super thick right now. You can see I'm, I'm not really I'm not babying this at all. I'm just getting it forged down, and that's that's on purpose, actually. If there's any, you know, if there's any flaw in the forge weld, if it's going to come apart, this is a this is a good opportunity with that lateral force for it to come apart. So that's kind of my reasoning there. Is like if we're going to have a forge weld fail at all, let's let's do it now. So kind of aggressively forging that down. So it's quite a bit of stock to take down, and the, the original dimensions were three half inch square bars that were four and a quarter inches long, and that produced uh, a ten and a quarter inch blade plus the tang, so quite a bit of steel there. Working the taper in, and then the tang. So the the typical or ubiquitous Arkansas toothpick design that we know today has a stick tang and usually like a rounded handle. So I'm, I'm doing the, the stick tang like, like so. And I'm not sure exactly what I'm doing on the handle yet. We'll see what happens. It would be nice to have a lathe if I was going to do, um, do the round handle like you typically see. So just get everything flattened down here and uh, the taper on the tang and then uh, forging down the corners as well so it's we don't have any sharp uh, um, angles on it. Mm -hmm. 
Now it's time to refine the profile of this blade, get that straightened out and consistent. You'll notice the very end of the blade there, that uh, little that little weld line terminating there. It's kind of off center, which is on purpose. And you don't want to have your I don't want to have the weld line terminate right at the, the tip or the point. Um, so I'm, I'm really paying attention to that here. And um, I've, right here I have ground off the very end of that weld back to black, back to the solid weld here. And then I'm uh, moving that over even some more and we'll grind that uh, little tail off, re reposition the point of our blade and that will orient that uh, weld line termination back off the back away from the point of the blade. You know this is the best case scenario keeping it away from the very tip and I'm not concerned with it being where it's at now but if you were to stick this blade into something and twist it you know that could put undue pressure on the on the uh, forge weld if it was right at the very tip. So I did a I did a profile forging on the blade and thought I was done and then I got to thinking as you know there this is really thick still you know about 5 16 probably and um, I was kind of worried about you know moving moving stuff around too much kind of like when you make a laminate blade but this isn't a laminate blade so thinking about it a little more and then decided you know I want a wider blade because this is still a little bit narrow for the um, the, the the accepted design of an Arkansas toothpick. So I want it a little wider and we got all this material here and I don't want to just grind it off. So let's forge in the bevels. So that's what I did and it turned out pretty good. Um, you'll notice that as you're forging, you have to, you need to forge equally on all four sides. If you don't, you're going to end up with like a corkscrew, pretty messed up critter. So, um, yeah, it's just a uh, consistent forging on all four sides and, and working those bevels in. But um, got that done and just trying to keep everything straight and even as possible going into the heat treating. And you'll notice there's no rough grinding. I didn't do any rough grinding. I, I instead I forged down to the thickness that I wanted, you know, pre-heat treat. And that'll that'll allow me to you know, plenty of material left to grind off my decarburized steel. And also if there's any warps or twists or bends that, you know, I can't uh, remedy during heat treat, that'll give me the maximum amount of material to take off if need be. And so you'll see here that into the quench, it's there's still no rough grinding, which is um, usually not my practice, but um, it's uh, forged down to a, thickness that I like prior to heat treating. So six and one, half and dozen the other, I guess. And it came out nice and straight. Um, little, a little bit of a bend that is, you know, kind of addressed there. But basically if you, if you pay attention to your forging and keep that even, um, and then do your, your normalizing and thermo cycles and then proper uh, quenching technique, you know, warping and twisting and that kind of thing really should not be um, an issue that you deal with much. So get that tempered and we're ready to start grinding on it. You see at the very tip there I ground, I was grinding back um, where that weld line was. There was a little bit of a line like I mentioned earlier where those radiuses that I put in there didn't come together 100% so just grind back to the uh, completed forge weld. Right here I'm just uh, Kind of evening everything up, getting getting it consistent. I'm still a long ways from the finished um, dimensions and, and edge thickness, certainly, but uh, get everything kind of consistent, and then I can come in and uh, grind in my blade profile before I actually start grinding the bevels. You kind of need to have that, you know, your profile established before you do the bevels because you're working off of the profile to determine where the center line or the ridge line of the double edge blade is at so it's, that's kind of important and once again of course you know making sure that you're grinding back to the steel that has not been decarburized I don't did I mention already 80 v 2 is um, 
it's pretty bad for decarb, um, a lot worse than most other steels. I'm not sure why, I know there's, sure there's probably a metallurgical reason with the alloy components and so forth, but anyway, now that we've got the uh, profile roughly established, we can take it to the piece of paper and using this little technique that I like to use, a lot of people do, but you just draw around one side of the blade, flip it over and, and match it and see where it falls over or under the line and then you know grind down the side that falls over so that's uh it took me about four or five times i think to to get it dialed in pretty close pretty nice and close so um it's a good way to do this and this is the final final one there close enough to start uh establishing the the bevels here all right so grinding a double-edged blade uh it's it's kind of a challenge it's I, I like it. it's enjoyable but you essentially one way to describe it is when you grind one of the four sides you are affecting all four sides so it, it's really kind of having a destination in mind you know what that's supposed to look like and then kind of working all four sides, you know, one at a time to achieve that. You know, because if you grind one side, you're, you're affecting the bevel width uh, of that same side on the other bevel, and you're also affecting the edge thickness on the opposite side of the blade, which if you address that is going to then affect everything all over again. So it's kind of interesting. And when you forge in your bevels, you know, you're not, you're not uh, scribing any lines onto your um, your blade on the edge of your blade to establish where everything's supposed to be, and so I think that's one reason why I like it because it's it's pretty it's a pretty raw form of craftsmanship, and so the um, the opportunity for the craftsman to you know bring out their skill is is. Uh, is a big is a big thing here I think so I'm I'm not an expert at, at it by any means but it's something I enjoy so you can kind of see that um, power core showing up a little bit 80 CRB2 kind of likes to to uh, corrode a little quicker so that was a little darker right there with the water on it and in the hand sanding so I only ground up to 240 grit which is not very high but uh, I actually didn't have any higher grit belts but also, you know, you kind of get to a point where you've got that center line established, the ridge and uh, your your edge thickness and everything, your bevels are where you want them. And then um, you, you kind of get to a point where you kind of want to leave it alone and not mess it up on the grinder. So just finishing things out with the hand sanding sometimes is not, you know, too bad anyways. So a couple hours on the hand sanding and then get it up to a thousand grit here and into the ferric chloride. So I think I had it in the ferric chloride four times. I wanted a nice deep etch on this to really establish that kind of that shadow around the power core on the blade here. And uh, cleaning off the iron oxides between each um, trip into the ferric chloride here with the thousand grit paper again. And uh, yeah, get this, get this etched out here. So it's turning out pretty good so far. Um, you know, I already have ideas about the next, you know, power core blade that I'm going to make and, and things to do differently. But that's what's cool about, that's what's cool about these projects is you, you just, every time you make one, make something, you learn something new. And that's, that's what I like about trying different techniques and things like that. So thinking about the handle, you know, what that's going to look like, you know, there's, there's a number of different, uh, you know, people have done a lot of different things with this and I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it exactly. But there's the flip side of the blade, and you can see how the power core is kind of off center. And it's, um, I think what happened there, because it's kind of off center the opposite way on the other side, as you can see. So I think things kind of got uh, forged at an angle a little bit somehow. Um, not exactly sure, but it's, uh, it's turning out pretty cool. So I'm excited for the next episode, and I hope you guys are too. As always, appreciate you watching. We'll see you on the next video.